The Witch is a movie from a little while ago that I saw with my dad before I left for the Port Authority. We saw it in theaters and after we left we got lunch at Panera Bread Company and just kinda looked out the window for a half an hour. What I'm trying to say is that it felt really bleak. I mean it's basically the filmic equivalent of going over to dinner at your friend's house but his dad starts yelling at him for being a druggy piece of shit and then his mom comes in and says everyone makes mistakes and then his dad points at him and says yeah clearly and your friend starts crying and the mom starts crying and then you start crying and I mean what's so bad about being a piece of shit anyway? I'm pretty sure I'm a piece of shit. Are my parents just better hiding these feelings? Who am I? Why is he- And so your first experience with the film is hardly going to be well, a positive one. I mean, you'll probably say to your friends that it's well made or something so that it doesn't sound like you don't have like the taste in artsy movies, but you're not gonna come out of this with a smile on your face. God knows I didn't. But give it some time and maybe talk to your metal friends about Satanism or something, and it becomes much easier to find a hopeful message in the text of the film. You see, even though it's about a witch, and let's be clear here, it's about a witch. This isn't some Arthur Miller namby pamby, it's about witches, but really it's about Paul McCartneyism or whatever bullshit. This is about historically researched, stick riding, kidnapping, soul selling, book brandishing, sexually liberated Satan ladies, and it's proud of that, goddammit! Anyway, the movie is about an actual flesh and blood witch, but the real antagonist of the film is the character's failure to live up to their own standards. Yeah, the film does start with like a, a witchy kidnapping, and this is some of the best horror filmmaking that I've ever seen in my life. But that only seems to catalyze the breakdown of this family unit, not necessarily a Initiated. Right, so th the true root of these characters' problems is that the puritanical ideal of the moral person is kind of an impossible and masochistic standard to hold oneself to. These ridiculous standards are made all the more absurd and horrifying by the Calvinist beliefs that a the bad luck that the family suffers is the direct result of their sin, and b that they are predestined either to heaven or to hell, and that they will only ever be able to find out which one it is once they've actually reached the afterlife. Tell me. Tell thee what. Is he an L? Caleb. Mother will not stop her prayer. And if I died, if I died this day... What is this? I ought evil in my heart. My sins are not pardoned. Thou art younger yet. And if God will not hear my prayer... Caleb! Tell me! Look, you. I love thee marvellous well. But tis God alone, not man, what knows who is a son of Abraham and who is not. Who is good and who is evil. And so here they are, a family banished from the society they crossed to a sea to be a part of, relying solely on their faith to guide them through their hardship. They each hold themselves to an unreachable standard on the off chance that they will even be considered for admission to heaven, convinced that if they do this correctly, God will guide them to a prosperous and happy life. But they don't, and he certainly doesn't. And so, the film repeatedly incorporates mistakes, both small and large, showing how natural human error inevitably causes them to stumble from the path that they've chosen for themselves. Alright, so it could be something simple like just uh, going off on a whim and teasing your sibling, or something huge like failing to raise a whole crop before winter, these characters are going to make mistakes. And I mean, of course they are, they're people, but they can't quite see it that way. They interpret every misstep as a footstep away from God's light, and end up seeing their own misfortune as a direct result of their mistakes. But a man's gotta eat, so they take shortcuts. William trades Catherine's silver cup for traps so he can catch food in case that his crop fails. I mean, I guess honestly good on him, because it does. Caleb expresses this weird, incestuous desire for Thomason, his sister, which wouldn't have developed if his parents didn't put him in a situation where he was some horny kid and his sister was the only person he could reasonably point his desire at. And then there's Thomason, who's consistently faithful, but is driven by the misogynistic distrust of her family into embracing this role of this evil, wicked girl even though she only does it to stop her annoying fucking sister. HOLY SHIT THESE KIDS ARE THE FUCKING WORLD! The point is that these people are squeezing their belts so tightly that their muffin tops have started oozing over the edge. Natural desires and reactions, when framed as these acts against God, take on lives of their own, and each member of the family is sent down their own horrible downward spiral. You see, William is a man who has principles, just not one that follows them too strictly. He knows the proper Bible verse for every situation, but when Catherine starts accusing Thomason of stealing her cup, he remains silent for all too long. It's been disappeared for some while. Just lose it. I've not touched it. Where is it gone, man? I haven't touched it. I've caught the trifling with it before. 
It's his own cowardice that leaves room for Catherine to basically drive herself crazy. And that allows the resentment toward Thomason to grow to the point where when her two piece of shit siblings accuse her of witchcraft, even he starts to buy into it. So here they are, a family that has squeezed themselves so hard into the constraints of Puritanism that they inevitably collapse in on themselves. When William says, Corruption, thou art my father. What he's really saying is that it's his natural human urges, and not the principles he's given himself, that really guide his actions. I mean, even though he left the settlement to live a fully godly life, the first thing he did in preparation for his godly life was duplicitously sell his wife's cup. The harder he tries to right his wrongs and put himself on the path to God, the further he plunges into this spiral of corruption and greed, and eventually the only thing he ends up getting right is just the mindless task of chopping wood and chopping wood and chopping wood. In the end, and the spiral leads to the death of the two twins at the hand of the witch they've basically been courting. Caleb, who succumbs to his own libido in a terrifying and pretty cool scene. And William, whose various flaws lead to him literally being overcome by Satan in the form of the movie's resident creepy goat Black Philip, and crushed by the logs he chopped that end up basically being a symbol for his own impotence. Catherine ends up dying at the hand of the daughter she's turned wicked by insisting from the beginning that that's basically how she always was. All of the these people just refuse to acknowledge the fact that their perceived sinfulness is really the result of basic human attributes, and as a result, they're all consumed by it. All except for Thomason, who is pushed by her family out of the Puritan world, and who ends up choosing the side of Satan. Dark. But not necessarily that hopeless. You see, Thomason signs her name in Satan's book and becomes a witch, which we have seen demonstrated as something horrifying, but that's not the only thing the film associates with witchcraft. You know, witchcraft is spooky, yes, but it also has many ties to nature. Both Black Philip and that uh, weird fucking bunny are embodiments of Satan, but they're also animals and therefore naturally true to themselves. The film also extracts a lot of its tone from lingering shots of dense forests and upturned trees with scary choral music in the background. And these trees kind of play a million different roles in the movie depending on the context or even just your own interpretation. Uh, in one scene, it could represent the uncertainty of the wilderness that they're now in, both literally and metaphorically. Uh, in another scene, they could kind of echo the cold indifference of God. Uh, but in the end, Thomason allows herself to be consumed by these trees and accepts her place in nature. It is only then that she finds her place in a coven of witches who celebrate her coming by, well, uh, well, coming. Alright, it's impossible to ignore the sexual imagery in the scene, and doing so would just be stupid. Up to this point, Thomason is only ever sexualized through the pubescent gaze of her brother, but now it's all about her. As she takes flight, we see her embracing the joy that comes from accepting human nature, sin, and the most natural impulse, you know, sex. Um, obviously this isn't a perfect solution to her problem. As far as uh, feminist readings go, it can't be ignored that sexual liberation by way of selling oneself to a dominant male figure isn't really the real sexual liberation, but in the context of the film, it's a way out. And regardless of the consequences, there is something truly satisfying about watching a character you sympathize break out of her shackles. In fact, it's almost magical.